shown a real willingness to to make significant changes to the bill. Unfortunately, there are others who are not engaging constructively, who are simply taking the approach of, you know, get off my lawn and uh, just don't want any regulation at all of AI. It's the Lawfare Podcast. I'm Kevin Frazier, assistant professor at St. Thomas University College of Law and a Tarbell Fellow at Lawfare, joined by California State Senator Scott Weiner. The existence of the uh, Frontier Model Division has caused a lot of concern and anxiety in some quarters, and and I am uh, not wedded to that. So that's an amendment Anthropic has proposed that we're, you know, quite open to. Today, we're talking about his safe and secure innovation for Frontier Artificial Intelligence Models Bill, also known as SB 1047, a controversial AI bill he's spearheading in the Golden State. Senator, you've fought some hard battles in your legislative career. In many cases, you've won and won big, earning praise from across the political spectrum, though mainly on the left. You now find yourself in one of the most heated political skirmishes you've perhaps ever fought. At a minimum, much of the tech world, including some of your constituents in San Francisco, stand in opposition to your bill. And if you read between the lines, some may think that FTC Chair Lena Khan may be another person who is perhaps not exactly on your side. She recently listened to your defense of SB 1047, and while she declined to comment on the bill itself, voiced her support for protecting openness in the AI industry. So given the headwinds you've encountered... What's motivating you to persist with this fight? What's driving Senator Weiner to make this one of his key legislative efforts? Well, thank you for having me. uh, And thank you for the opportunity to talk about promoting innovation in AI and also acknowledging that this is incredibly powerful, transformative technology that can make the world a better place, but that also creates risks and that we should not bury your head in the sand and be mindful of those risks uh, and that it's reasonable to ask the large AI labs to do exactly what they have committed to doing repeatedly, which is to perform safety testing on their uh, large AI models before they train and release them. Uh, and so that that's all we're doing with this bill. This bill does uh, nothing more uh, than ask The largest AI labs, when they are training and releasing huge, powerful models to simply do what they have committed to doing, which is to perform safety testing to mitigate potential catastrophic risks, uh, that's what we're asking them to do. And it's uh, perfectly reasonable. There is actually quite a bit of support for this bill, if you ask people, including folks who are in tech. But there are a group of, of, of folks who are very opposed to it. I, I think whatever one's view is of AI, this is powerful, powerful technology. And it's perfectly appropriate to promote both innovation and safety. So you've emphasized that you do not want to cabin innovation. You've touted that you've long championed innovation in the state. And yet we have the folks who are supposedly the innovators themselves, if you look at groups like A16Z, uh, arguably Anthropic, and some of the other labs, Meta, have come out either directly in opposition to the bill or perhaps questioning the bill or asking for some pretty large amendments. Why do you think they're getting this innovation question wrong? Why are the folks trying to support these startups miscalculating when they say, you're actually going to squash innovation in California? Well, first of all, just to be clear, Anthropic has said in writing that they will support the bill if we make certain amendments. And as I've stated repeatedly in public, we are generally positive about the amendments that Anthropic has proposed. Listen, this has been a very transparent process. I started working on this a year and a half ago. We actually took the extraordinary, very rare step of of, uh, releasing a public outline of the bill very, very formally last September for the exclusive purpose of soliciting feedback from big tech companies, from startups, from investors, from academics, from from activists, from anyone who wanted to comment 
uh, to say, tell us what you think of these ideas. And we have engaged with anyone who will engage with us. And we have received some very good faith engagement from Anthropic, from GitHub, from various uh, folks in big tech and small tech. And we've made significant changes to the bill um, along the way, including in direct response to concerns from folks in the open source uh, space. Very significant amendments we've made and very appreciative that Anthropic has come forward with feedback and ideas, uh, which, as I mentioned, we are favorably disposed towards those ideas. Uh, my goal here is not just to, it's not about winning or losing. I want to get this right. And so for the folks who have constructively engaged, we appreciate that. And I've shown a real willingness to, to make significant changes to the bill. Unfortunately, there are others who are not engaging constructively, who are simply taking the approach of, you know, get off my lawn and uh, just don't want any regulation at all of AI. Uh, and you mentioned Lena Khan. She, um, she, first of all, she spoke before I spoke, so she did not hear uh, me talking about the bill. And I thought she took a very balanced approach where she, uh, I think, absolutely did not say she was opposed to regulation of AI. She also said she supports open source. I support open source as well. And so they're, they're unfortunately, in addition to the folks who are constructively engaging, which is great, there are people who have been and, and organizations that have not constructively engaged and have put out fear tactics and misinformation about the bill. Unfortunately, there are some within A16Z who have participated in that, telling AI model developers that the bill will send them to prison, which is absolutely false, and yet they keep saying that, putting out information about how uh, the bill will, will impose a significant risk of liability that doesn't exist today. That is inaccurate. AI model developers can be sued today, and the potential liability that they face today is profoundly broader than the extremely narrow uh, liability uh, that is possible under the bill. So, you know, it's politics. And I also understand that the tech industry does not want to be regulated. And that's why Congress has never enacted a data privacy law. Here we are in 2024. There's no federal data privacy law, which is supported overwhelmingly by the public because the tech industry has incapacitated Congress from passing that law. Uh, there's no net neutrality federal law. There's, you know, very little with social media. They banned TikTok. It looks like there's now a child protection bill that's moving forward. But we have had to act in California because the tech industry has prevented Congress from acting. And I am not just trying to shove something down tech's throat. We are working very collaboratively with anyone who will work with us. To that collaborative approach, which I think you're spot on. Anyone who's tracked the bill can see that there have been significant amendments made in response to feedback, including changing the threshold for which models may qualify, which is obviously a huge deal. Of the anthropic amendments, I think one of the bigger ones is calling for not creating the frontier model division, which would have arguably the main role in enforcing and yeah. paying attention to this regulation. So... Is that one of the amendments you're open to? Yes. Okay. No, with the Frontier Model Division, it's a, we, we created that division. It's not even its own agency, the division of the Department of Technology. In order to have, uh, you know, an, an agency or a division that will um, receive the reports, and then they have one power, uh, which is to, after a few years, adjust the size threshold it's currently set at 10 to the 26 flop. They can adjust it, but not the $100 million training threshold, which they cannot touch. So the frontal model division has very, very little authority. The attorney general is the individual who really will enforce, not the frontier model division. But the, but the existence of the uh, frontier model division has caused a lot of concern and anxiety in some quarters. And and I am uh, not wedded to that. And so that's an amendment Anthropic has proposed that we're, you know, quite open to. So we know there are at least seven hills in San Francisco, and that's not one you will die on. Okay, duly noted. 
of the other amendments. 40, I think it's 48 hills, actually. 48 hills? Seven, it's seven miles by seven miles, 48 hills, yeah, something okay. like that. All right, all right. They're, they're, it's a complex geography. That's yes. for our next podcast. For now, uh, another major amendment I'd say that Anthropic has suggested is – changing some of the requirements for what qualifies as a critical harm. They've called for excluding perhaps the use of models in national security contexts. What's your response to that exclusion that they're calling for? There are a few items that they raise around that because we define critical harm as uh, having to do with uh, chemical, nuclear, biological, et cetera, uh, weapon, having to do with cyber crime causing more than $500 million in damage, damage to critical infrastructure causing more than $500 million in damage, or harms of a similar scale. In terms of national security, and we're open to a conversation about there are certain things that could be in the bill that could be preempted under federal law, and, and certain aspects of national security could fall in that category. And so we're absolutely open to refining uh, the bill to make that clear. So we may continue to see SB 1047 evolve throughout the month of August as it continues to receive scrutiny from the Assembly. But we know that SB 1047 isn't the only bill addressing AI in California. AB 3211, which would require generative AI systems to keep a log of any piece of potentially deceptive content, is also moving relatively quickly through the legislative process. So when we think about innovation in California, are you concerned that the cumulative effect of these bills may result in SFO being full of AI experts looking for greener pastures? It's really interesting. Some of the critics of SB 1047 say, hey, don't regulate at the model level, regulate at the application level. If someone is using a model for something bad, a deep fake, revenge porn, algorithmic discrimination, whatever the case may be, regulated at that level. My, my take is, of course, we should be, if someone's using an AI model or anything else to do something terrible, that should be illegal and there should be accountability for that. But if the model can reasonably be designed in a way to reduce the risk that the model will shut down the grid or or do whatever terrible thing, uh, we should do that as well. The two are not mutually exclusive. But I, I think what we're seeing is that as some folks say, hey, don't regulate at the model level, regulate at the application level. Well, they're also opposing efforts to regulate at the application level. So, you know, query what that means in terms of some of the engagement that we're seeing and, and some of the desire simply to have no uh, regulation in the public interest uh, whatsoever. But in terms of, you know, the bills that we're seeing in the legislature, in addition to SB 1047, there's the watermarking bill, there's a, a major bill about algorithmic uh, discrimination, we have a bill about AI generated uh, revenge porn, and probably a couple of others. You know, of course, we want to um, make sure that all of this is coordinated that it's all consistent. I don't think that this is going to push, these bills are not going to push AI innovation uh, outside of California. SB 1047, in addition to, I imagine all of these bills, they're not limited to companies that are headquartered or doing AI development in California. That's not what triggers them. It's doing business in California. And, and so this whole notion that you know, oh, they're going to move to, you know, Miami or Austin or whatever the other, you know, flavor of the day is. I don't buy that. I mean, we, we know that tech is spreading out regardless. That's been happening for quite some time. California is the fifth largest economy in the world. It is an absolute global epicenter of, of tech and tech investment uh, and having reasonable laws protecting the public, that's not going to drive this work out of California. Just like when we passed the California data privacy law in 20, I believe it was 18, because Congress had not acted. If you look at the opposition, it said, you're going to push the industry out of California. Well, guess what? That didn't happen. 
so, you know, we want to be, of course, mindful uh, of, of wanting to support innovation in California. And there are parts of this bill that specifically do that. And we're working with opposition to, you know, refine the bill. But I, I think there's a whole argument that if you do anything around tech regulation, you're going to push the industry out of California. It's been proven not to be accurate. So given the America-wide, nationwide implications of SB 1047, AB 3211, any other AI legislation we come down the pike, to the AI developer in Iowa or the AI developer in Louisiana, what's your response to, well, Senator Weiner, that's great that you want those regulations in California, but why should I be subject to what a couple of folks in San Francisco and across the Golden State have to think about AI? This is a federal issue and should be decided at the federal level. Well, first of all, those AI developers in Iowa or wherever else, they're highly unlikely to be covered by SB 1047. Uh, The bill only applies if you are spending more than $100 million to train your model. So if you're not spending $100 million, you are simply not covered by the bill. And, and, and by the way, it's tied to inflation, so it will go up over time. Uh, and, and so people need to really understand that. But in terms of should this be handled at the federal level? Absolutely. I would love for Congress to get it together to act in a number of different areas, not just AI, but as I mentioned, data privacy, social media. I authored California's net neutrality law in 2018 after Trump's FCC got rid of net neutrality protections. I wish that Congress would just pass a strong federal net neutrality law. Six years later, it hasn't done so. Uh, So yeah, this should be handled at the federal level, but the tech industry has made it impossible for Congress to do that. And so here we are, uh, in California, wanting to protect the public, wanting to protect our states. And so we're, we're doing what we need to do. And I think we're doing it in a thoughtful way with an open door, as you acknowledge, thank you, taking very significant amendments in response to feedback from folks in the AI uh, sector, including in the open source sector. For example, we made an uh, amendment making crystal clear that if you no longer have possession of a model, so if you open source the model and others are then using it, you no longer have a responsibility to be able to shut down the model because that's one of the requirements in the bill. You have to be able to shut down the model that you develop. But if you open source it and, some, and it's no longer in your possession, someone else is using it, you do not have that responsibility any longer. In addition, if someone takes an open source model and fine tunes it to a significant degree, it's no longer your responsibility. It becomes effectively someone else's model. So we have over and over again uh, listened to feedback and made significant changes. And I anticipate we will, we will be making more significant changes in response to the Anthropic letter. Well, so I guess my friends in Des Moines and Baton Rouge can rest easy, at least in that regard. But with respect to the Well, idea, they should come to San Francisco, too. It's they, you know, they've got an open invite. Oh, housing are expensive. I apologize for that. There, We're there we go. So stay away from San Francisco. The message <laughs> from now, I'm just messing. So with respect to the superiority, perhaps, in an ideal policy world of Congress settling this issue, what sort of development would cause you to pump the brakes on pushing SB 1047? We've seen OpenAI has announced its support for at least three AI bills. Uh, increased funding for the U.S. AI Safety Institute, a bill supporting AI education initiatives, and one supporting a AI research resource. What if we saw one of those bills take off? Would you say, "All right, we'll give we'll give Congress some time to see if they can take this regulatory challenge," or are you done waiting for congressional action? Yeah, I think I mean Congress is typically the power to preempt uh, state laws. So if in a year or two years or five years, Congress passed an AI safety law and said we're preempting state laws, they can do that. Just like they could tomorrow pass a data privacy law and preempt the California law if they wanted to. Have they passed that data privacy law six years later? No, they haven't. They could preempt us on net neutrality. Have they passed a net neutrality law six years uh, later? No, 
they haven't. So they have every ability to do that. And I don't, given Congress's track record, Congress, by the way, does a lot more than people think. Congress has, in recent years, done a lot of really amazing things around infrastructure, climate, um, supporting working families. So I'm not saying I don't buy into the Congress doesn't do anything. Congress does a lot of things around technology in particular. The last major law that Congress has passed was in the 1990s. And since then, it's been like banning TikTok and now potentially this social media kids bill. And so having bills introduced on AI innovation and safety, having, I'm glad that OpenAI is supporting some of these bills. That's terrific. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're going to pass. And we also know, I am going to work really hard to, to help Kamala Harris get elected president of the United States. If Donald Trump wins, he's already made clear because of the, the Republican platform is to repeal the Biden executive order, which is not binding, by the way, but it's still good. Uh, and the Republicans have committed to repealing that executive order. Uh, Republicans in the House have been working to defund NIST. Uh, and, and so if the election goes in a certain direction, we could see even moving backwards on federal efforts around AI safety. As the bill stands now, there's still a tremendous amount of ambiguity, and you've emphasized that some of these things will have to be worked out over time, uh, including, for example, training costs, what will be included in that $100 million threshold for when you've crossed that bridge. And some commentators fearful of the impact on AI development have said the big labs, big tech is going to dominate that process after the fact of refining some of the definitions within the bill to benefit them. What are you doing now to try to assist small labs having a voice, those startups, those innovators in refining some of these terms if the bill gets enacted? Well, there's the bill. I, I don't agree that the bill is like super ambiguous and We'll continue to work between now and the end of August to, if, you know, and if folks think there's anything that needs to be tightened, we want to hear about that. Um, but we've been working very hard to tighten things up. So this is not a situation where some regulatory body is going to be able to rewrite all sorts of aspects of the bill. You're always going to have to strike a balance between being prescriptive in the bill and having some flexibility. And people are going to criticize you if it's too prescriptive or it's, too flexible. And, you know, we, we actually have require open source representation on one, on there's an open source body that's being created. Uh, so I, I think the whole goal is to have that kind of diversity of, uh, of representation. There's been a narrative about this bill that it's some sort of regulatory capture by big tech. Of course, Google and Meta are opposing the bill. So that would be a odd thing for them to oppose a bill that's going to allow them to engage in regulatory capture. I don't think there's going to be any regulatory capture here. And you've emphasized that the bill is not intended to quash in any way open source model development. Well, you've also stressed that the animating factor is the prevention of some of these catastrophic risks. We recently saw Llama 3.1 get released. It's an incredibly capable open source model are you thinking now that perhaps there should be a more stringent approach to open source if we see that these sorts of models can have such extensive capabilities and are now going to be even more broadly available? If the goal is to prevent these catastrophic risks, might now be the time to be more hands-on with respect to open source models? Uh, listen, I know there's a whole debate happening around open source. There are people who hate open source. There are people who love open source. My view here is I support open source and I'm, and I'm, I'm not in any way opposed to open sourcing. I think open sourcing has huge potential benefits in terms of democratizing AI, uh, in terms of allowing really smart people to look under the hood uh, and make improvements to a model, including improvements around safety. So I'm not a critic of, of open source. And I know a lot of startups in particular um, really rely on open source, open sourcing of models, you know, including, including Llama. And so we also need to acknowledge that open source, like other models, also 
can bring safety risks. And so that's why we don't want to exempt open source because open source, just like any other model, perhaps in different ways, can cause good to happen and also uh, harm. You know, so so unlike some folks who want to ban open source, I, I don't fall into that category at all. But there, but I, I think we need to acknowledge that there are risks. Like Lawrence Lessig, who is like a major open source advocate in technology in general, has raised concerns about Meta's approach in, in terms of releasing the model globally. So, and that that's his perspective. He's a really smart guy. I'm not going down that path. Whether it's an open source model or otherwise, perform the safety testing. Meta is one of the companies that went to Seoul, South Korea, that went to the White House and is repeatedly committed to doing safety testing on its open source model. And we're simply asking them to keep their commitment. And with regard to that testing, a lot of focus has been drawn to the difficulties of what some say is proving a negative. How can you prove that a model isn't going to cause critical harms? What What is your response yeah. to, to, to this take? That, that is another sort of uh, characterization of the bill that some of the opponents have put out that's not accurate. You don't have to, wait, well, I forget, what was the word you used? Proving a negative. Prove, right? You have to prove that it's not going to cause harm. You have to guarantee that it's not going to cause harm. All of these extreme categorical words that are used, that's not what the bill says. The bill talks about reasonable assurance. This is not about guaranteeing that your model is not going to cause harm. It's not about certifying that it can't cause harm. It is about conducting reasonable safety evaluation, determining whether there is a a real actual risk of catastrophic harm. And then if so, taking reasonable steps to reduce that risk, not to eliminate the risk. Life is about risk. It's impossible to eliminate risk. And if you're eliminating risk can have its own very bad consequences, like undermining innovation. And that's why we don't require eliminating the risk or having like certainty that nothing can go wrong. And so in terms of the testing, this bill does not like, like it's not like there was no, there's no testing and the bill says thou shalt test. There sh- we're going to will it into existence. The testing is exists now. The, the labs, these labs all say that they are testing, that they're planning to test. And, and, they've, and they've made formal commitments in, at the White House and Seoul, et cetera. And so I, I, I think that this, there's a, this narrative like, oh, there's no testing. You're asking us to do something that's impossible. It doesn't exist. Well, they, they all say they're doing it. And so I, I, you know, I think what we're asking is being done and is perfectly reasonable. If we had a open source lab create Blama 3.1, some other open source model that's just as capable as Llama 3.1, how would they be able to show a reasonable assurance that a user, let's say a bad actor in a foreign country, wouldn't use it to further a critical harm, even if modified less so than the threshold for qualifying them as being exempt? Yeah, and to be clear, I am not a technologist, and I I am not the expert on how the testing works. And so you, you should absolutely ask someone who's an expert <laughs> in, in testing to talk about how you can do that in terms of open sourcing, extremely large model. We know that there are different strategies like, you know, doing extremely thorough red teaming, for example, they're doing that now. Uh, and again, Meta says that they are doing this testing. So the people who actually know how to do this testing, say that they're doing it. Uh, And the bill is also flexible as to what kind of testing you do. The bill is not prescriptive. You know, red teaming is one example, but I know that there are, that there are others. So if you continue to receive feedback, as you've mentioned, you're open to saying that, you know, reasonable assurances with respect to some uses of open source models and some of these critical harms is just not feasible at this point. Would that be something you'd be open to considering in further amendments? I've had an open door for a year and a half now. You should probably lock your door. <laughs> I, 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 you know, you got you got to be flexible in life. I, I mean, I literally like when we 
published our initial outline last September, I affirmatively like texted and sent it around to a whole bunch of people, including people I thought might have questions or concerns because we want that feedback. We're, we are near the end of the process now, but there's still time. And so we welcome uh, the feedback. And there are some people who are just categorically opposed who are never going to, you know, provide feedback or proposed amendments. You know, A16, I think, falls into that category. They prefer to put a bunch of stuff on Twitter, which is fine. It's their First Amendment right to do that. But there are other organizations like Anthropic, like GitHub, like even Meta. Meta has been collaborative and talking to us and, and and trying to brainstorm ideas. And we really appreciate that. And I'm of the view that even if someone is opposing my bill, if they have a, a reasonable, good idea, I want to know about it. I don't only listen to people who are supporting what I'm doing. I, I'm, I listen to anyone with good faith, constructive feedback. Well, before I let you go, I do have to ask, because you've mentioned that you're not quite as far as some may be with respect to, for example, limiting the risks posed by open source, but you're clearly concerned about catastrophic risks. So, Senator Weiner, what is your P-Doom? <laughs> I know uh, that there has been a, there's a range. I forget what Lena Khan said. I think she said 15%, which is, you know, that's still concerning, right? And there are other people who say 40, who say 1%. I, I am not focused on doomsday. You know, we can talk about, you know, the, the doom scenarios. I'm not a doomer, but I think there are a lot of scenarios that are short of doomsday, like a model helping shut down the grid. Um, that's not doomsday scenario, but that's a very tangible, significant harm that we can all envision, right? That's not robots coming and, and taking over and, and, and her rounding everyone up and sending us off somewhere or killing people. That's like a tangible thing that can happen, that actually does happen today, right? There, there are criminals who do things like try to shut down the grids or shut down the banking system. And, and so that's a very tangible thing that people can get their heads around today. It's very real. And that's what I'm focused on. Those kinds of harms. Well, Senator, I know you have a busy August ahead, so we will leave it there. Thank you for having me. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare Podcasts by becoming a Lawfare Material Supporter through our website, lawfaremedia.org slash support. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Look out for our other podcasts, including Rational Security, Chatter, Allies, and The Aftermath, our latest Lawfare Presents podcast series on the government's response to January 6th. Check out our written work at lawfaremedia.org. The podcast is edited by Jen Pacha, and your audio engineer this episode was Kara Schillen of Goat Rodeo. Our theme song is from Alibi Music. As always, thank you for listening.